Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live. I am your host Viz and tonight for the first time we are holding a Dead Talk Live team entertainment news roundtable. And let me just introduce you guys first. On the left we have our executive producer Efren Rodriguez and on the right we have one of our lead writers Bob Garland. Guys, thank you for coming on here. We're just going to have yes. a we're just going to have a chat tonight. Do a little roundtable discussion of some entertainment headlines and topics. And to just let you guys know on how this idea came up, we have a pretty nice sized team here at Dead Talk Live, Dead Talk Media in general, and we all communicate through WhatsApp. We have a, a several different chats where it's broken up by department, and then we also have a general chat. So Every day throughout the day, we chat, uh, share information, links, news, opinions, maybe poke <laughs> a little fun at each other every now and again, you know, keep things lighten up. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, we've built a nice, close family. So I just had this idea of, you know what, let's just bring this discussion to the screen one night, see what kind of reaction we get and just go from there so we're just gonna get started right away uh and we're gonna start off tonight's topic with a movie that literally just came out of nowhere uh and has become such a hit it's been greenlit for a sequel it's at over 95 million dollars worldwide already and that is universal pictures megan now i have not seen the film Efren, I don't think you've seen the film either, right? I have not, no. Okay, so Bob, that leaves you. You have seen this film. So what is it about this Universal Pictures film that has just taken off? I mean, yeah, I mean, Universal is the one who did the Halloween trilogy. What makes Megan so damn good? Well, you saw The Exorcist, or not The Exorcist, um, you saw uh, the Child's Play remake, right? Yeah. Basically the exact same story from the trailer. Uh, a guardian gets the uh, gets this kid, this electronic toy, and it just goes crazy. But in this one, um, it, it's a little girl. Her parents die literally the beginning of the movie, and her aunt works at this, like, big toy company. It's... I guess it's supposed to be like part part Apple, part Hasbro, where they do like a lot of these like really advanced toys. And um, she's been working the 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 aunt played by uh, Allison Williams from Get Out. Mm -hmm. She works there and she develops this prototype, which is Meg, and ends up pairing it with her niece since her niece just lost her her parents. And the doll is kind of like helping her get through everything. And then the doll just starts going crazy. Now that sounds very familiar, you know, like Child's Play, like you mentioned, but also a movie recently where we had on the cast and crew, and that's uh, Christmas Bloody Christmas, where this AI Santa just decides to go crazy. So Efren, this is not a new story. Not having seen the movie, Having heard what the story's about, what do you think, you know, lent to the success that this movie is seeing right now? Well, that's exactly it. You just mentioned Christmas, Bloody Christmas. And I mean, that, that's it's that kind of fear of AI that, that everybody seems to have. And, and it's been around for decades. I mean, come on, go back to the Terminator Westworld. <laughs> But the original Westworld even. does Megan Bob does Megan take place like in today's world or like fifty years in the future or something like that? It's supposed to be today's world, but some of the stuff that exists are clearly for the movie, so it's kind of like it. It's more like it should probably take place the next couple years, so it's a little bit more ambiguous with the kind of stuff that it has, like tech wise. But it, the movie itself, seems to present itself as if it's twenty twenty three or whenever it was shot now that reminds me of like one of my favorite ai films and that's i robot all right where we have the three laws mm -hmm. okay that will prevent a robot 
from hurting a human being. What is it with this uh, prototype, Megan? Uh, does she is she actually artificial intelligence? Does she develop the ability to think for herself? Does she develop a conscience, uh, the ability to make decisions without any programming? What is it about her? Yeah. So. The, well, do you want a spoiler on like the theory on like where? Yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a point where a dog bites the the niece. Megan goes to kind of like pull the kid away and gets under this fence, and the dog bites uh, the doll on the neck, and that just kind of causes it to go crazy. But it goes completely AI. Like they build it as an AI, and I'm pretty sure they don't they don't mention the three laws of robotics. And I was sitting in the theater, and I, that the first thing when I started seeing like what I considered was the red flags, I was like, they, they should have put that in very first thing was the three laws, Mm -hmm. but it does. It becomes its own kind of AI. It becomes kind of like a, uh, a toddler Skynet, so to speak. I I don't, I don't want the ending spoil, but this thing has been greenlit for a sequel because of the success it's seen so far. And let me just show you guys some of the numbers. Here we go. Domestically in the United States, to date, over $60 million, international over $35 million for a total gross worldwide of not over $95 million. When, and this has been out for 11 days, less than two weeks, and it's about to break the $100, the $100 million mark. That's just phenomenal. Uh, uh, you know, for a horror movie, that came out around Christmas time to bring in this kind of money. Normally, Christmas time is not the season for horror movies. So that's against what kind of a budget? Yeah. Well, this is Universal Pictures, so you know this had a big budget. This is a studio I, I, film. This is. I, I thought. I thought Blood Blumhouse. Blumhouse. Was with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Blumhouse works with a lot of different distributors and other companies, but Blumhouse also did the Halloween movies. Well, I mean, Blumhouse usually they're they're pretty good about raking things in no more than maybe fifteen million. Like I know the Halloween movies got a little bit carried away on their budget, but I think Megan was somewhere around that uh twelve, thirteen million. And I think I saw it on Wikipedia, so I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. This is box office mojo, which is now owned by IMDB. What I loved about Box Office Mojo before it was taken over by Amazon is that it actually told you the production budget. They have since removed that, and we have mm-hmm. no idea. But if you look at you know the opening date, which is January 6th, hell, it's after Christmas. It's a New Year's movie, $11 mm-hmm. million, dollars, <laughs> and then around... Day 11, it shoots back up to $7.5 million, and it's been up and down, but it's been steady the whole way through. So I'm going to check... always shoot up. What'd you say? Weekends, it'll always shoot up, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to check it out when it comes out on Peacock, since it is a universal film, and see what just all the, the rave is about. But you personally, Bob... I mean, did you enjoy this film? Yeah, I mean, it was a good popcorn movie, and I, usually when I go into horror, like that's my rule of thumb is don't expect Shakespeare. Just you know, <laughs> hope it's hope I can turn my brain off and have fun. But and it, that, that's pretty much what it was. I mean, that's that's what the movies are about, man. But is it is it a good horror film in regards to story? Is there just a lot of blood? It looks it doesn't look like a bloody film. It looks like a psychological thriller. It's PG thirteen, and I I dug into it. I did a little bit of research. Apparently, there were there was an R rated cut, but uh, it rode the line between R and PG thirteen like so close that they said, "Well, you know what? We'll we'll reshoot the couple scenes we need to to get it down, and then we'll release it that way." Was it? Blo- I'd like to. See, you like? I'd like to see an R cut. Was it bloodier or less bloodier than what you thought it would be going into the theater? Um. I guess less bloodier because I I expected more, more angle and more visuals on the actual like kills. I mean, yeah, but this is there's a lot of it. 
that's cut that's it more, way. More child's play. Kind yeah, of. yeah, that's what I was going to say. This isn't a sadistic Chucky, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who just before he's, you know, he's cornered in a toy store and is about to get popped. He embeds his soul into a doll, you know, and that's how the whole how the whole child's play uh, franchise got started. So now, on to another thing here. Let me bring up. Let me bring us back up to the website, and that is HBO's The Last of Us. Okay. Now I have not seen this either, but this is based off of a game. All right, and it's had like the second largest debut right behind House of the Dragon. Have both you guys watched this? Yeah, I watched yeah, it yes. this morning. All right, Efren, what is this about? Um, I mean, it's basically apocalypse. You know, the apocalypse, zombie apocalypse from the beginning. Oh, so this is a zombie show. Sort of. I mean, it's. Mm. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. You know, because it's brand new. Uh-huh. But um, but it's it's like a viral zombie apocalypse, is all I'll say. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very different take on mm-hmm. like how you would do a zombie. Is it more yeah. like Resident Evil as opposed to you know no. Romero? Uh, no, no, no. It, it's very, very different, but very kind of original almost in the way they went about it. Okay, it's an environmentally friendly zombie. <laughs> all right now this is no excuse for me not having to watch it so i'm going to be checking this out really really soon. oh you'd love it but they did a phenomenal job i mean i was i didn't expect it to be anywhere near as good as it was did hbo max drop the whole season at once or they released no, just no, the first. one episode so there's only and one it, episode out right now. one episode and it's a long episode it's like 80 something minutes i think well but that's weird one... because uh I guess for a, t- a gaming title, uh, this must have been really popular as a game to on its debut, on its pilot sh- episode, to draw in 4.7 million viewers. Well, oh, they've it, been working on this for for yeah. years. When the when the game first came out, Sam Raimi was mm-hmm. gonna do a movie about it. Like the next day, they greenlit <laughs> a movie for it. And what happened with that? Mm-hmm. It just came through. Yeah. It just got to, okay. Uh, so it ended but up. Here's, here's, what, here's what'll happen. Eventually those numbers are gonna go down because obviously the, the gamers weren't so impressed by it. Um, oh yeah. They're, and everybody, they're everybody hardcore. expects it to be, yeah, everybody expects it to be exactly the way it was in the game. And that's not gonna happen. It's the same thing with books turned into it's movies. Gotta be, it's Games gotta be an adaption. turned into movies. Yeah, it's and, an adaption. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'm just trying... an adaption, they did an amazing job. I mean, I, I, like I said, I was in awe. So I the, think it'll have the lasting power. Well, because of what's going on now. Like, we're, we're talking about it because it's making all the headlines. So, I didn't know. I had not heard of this. I was It was not on my radar. But now, through the headlines and us talking about it and word of mouth, I'm going to start checking this out. And I'm sure I'm going to love it. So well, it also it dropped at the perfect time because The Walking Dead just ended, yeah. and there's that that void. So, mm-hmm. I mean, House of the Dragon. The only way it could have done better is if it drops about six months after Game of Thrones ended, and this drops relatively in that same kind of window, and it's filling that void. So you have a lot of people who probably didn't play the games that just like were obsessed with Walking Dead. I guarantee you they're probably going straight for this just what? because it. Yeah, right, right. Same, same night, same same time. I mean, and House of the Dragon. Color. I mean, that had the Game of Thrones following. Okay, so they you knew that was going to get a large following at least for its debut episode, and people were going to decide. It, it was just that the show is phenomenal. It's a great show, and that's why viewership sort of persisted and grew as the House House of the Dragon season progressed uh and through the first season with this show i guess a lot of the gamers are the ones who tuned in and then probably after word of mouth very soon after the premiere date when it dropped a lot of people tuned in and thus the numbers that it has with 4.7 million so i'm definitely going to be checking this out as well speaking of zombies we got to talk about 
Fear of the Walking Dead after an, is announced uh, final season. So now we have The Walking Dead, which ended last last year, December. Uh, that's all done with. That was the main show, the mother show that went on for 12 years. Uh, Fear of the Walking Dead, the uh, first spinoff that started about four years into The Walking Dead and is about to premiere its uh, eighth season. AMC announced that it's going to end. This eighth season is going to be the final season for Fear of the Walking Dead. To let our viewers know what AMC is going to do with that is they're going to break it up into two six episode segments so the first six episodes are going to air in may and then the final six episodes i'm guessing are going to air either late summer or october so Efren, in your mind your amc okay you just wrapped up one of your most successful shows of all time and now you're wrapping up its first spin-off you're putting all your Walking Dead chips on these two other spinoffs that are coming soon. One of them is the Maggie and Negan one. And then I believe later on this year is um, Norman Reedus's uh, Daryl one in Paris, in, in France. The Rick and Michonne one is going to be a limited series probably maybe one or two seasons at most but that's not coming till 2024 so if you're amc what's your logic behind killing off fear the walking dead after this year and putting all your your bets on those spinoffs right there only thing i could imagine is maybe budgeting because it it almost seemed unprecedented. Come on, they, they just brought Kim Dickens back at the end of the last season. It looked like they were, at least I, I would think they were they were going to go longer than this. Me too. When I first heard uh, several years ago now that they were canceling The Walking Dead, I thought fear would, persi would persist for several more seasons. So I was kind of surprised last week when I found out that they're ending the show. Uh, Fear of the Walking Dead never had the numbers that The Walking Dead did. And people, whenever I spoke to people, uh, when they asked about Fear of the Walking Dead, I always told them, don't compare it up to The Walking Dead. Judge it as its own show. It has its own characters. Yeah, there is crossover. But judge it on its own merits. And if you do that, it's a pretty decent show. Uh, they just brought back one of the early season's favorite in Madison and Kim Dickens, just to find out that this is the final season and they're going to be getting rid of her. Now, I have, let's see, uh, right here, they released a trailer. So let's go ahead and watch this Fear the Walking Dead trailer of the final season eight. Morning, Laura. It's that time of the week. I think this is a flashback. You play nice today. You see you're skipping meals again? We have ways to make you eat. Next week, Laura. Ah! 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 Ah!
ammo down here? Alright, so two things with that uh, trailer right there. I think it's a flashback to Definitely. Yeah. Uh it looks like a flashback to before she runs into Morgan. What do you think is up with that bite mark on her arm? I mean, that is a bite mark. When she rolled up her sleeve to draw that blood or whatever, I mean, it, it can't be a zombie. I mean, they put it there for us to guess. But I don't know. I have no idea what that is about. Maybe but, it is a zombie. Maybe they found a way to stop the infection or slow it down. I don't think... Uh, I was just reviewing in my head the... Uh, the final episodes that we saw her in in last season i can't remember if it's possible that she could have had an amputated uh arm and she was just using a fake limb or something so i don't know but anyway the final season of fear of the walking dead premieres this may first six episodes the last six episodes are going to be coming later on this year so now, this is funny. Our next topic. Velma. Okay. <laughs> Scooby-Doo. Oh, God. Come on. Everybody <laughs> loves Scooby-Doo. We we all have kids, my, you know, and I watched Scooby-Doo. I didn't watch Scooby-Doo growing up. I watched Scooby-Doo with my kids when they were growing up. So, <laughs> but anyway, Velma, uh, the show is getting a lot of flack, Okay. It's also on HBO Max. I have not seen this either. But, Bob, why is Velma getting such negative pushback, to put it mildly? Well, for one, it's getting pushback by everybody. Like, left, right, everybody has been pushing back on this. And it really comes down to is uh, Mindy Kaling, the, the writer and the the voice actress or voice actor playing Velma basically didn't actually put Velma in the show, just put herself in it and just made herself Velma and actually didn't really add any of the character. Then they advertise this as a prequel to the show. Okay. So apparently this is supposed to be before they group together and solve mysteries. And it's just, it's changing one thing after another but it's also making things adult when it's Scooby-Doo. It was never meant to be adult. You know, Scooby-Doo was always a children's property. And I don't think anybody, I don't think there was anybody clamoring for them to do a Riverdale update or animated version of uh, Scooby-Doo, especially when it's on probably not the most popular character out of that gang. Yeah. If you were going to do, if you were going to do a prequel, you would probably either go, with Scooby, which they did. They did one in, I think, the 80s, a pub named Scooby-Doo. And I watched that religiously like I watched the original. Or you would do it about Shaggy because, one, his dad's a cop, so he's kind of got more of an interesting story to tell there, but also because he's connected to the dog. The dog is the show. Yeah. Nobody... You wouldn't do Flintstones without... Uh, right. Without the kids. Because that they're just that important. But this show, Velma, it's like take the Flintstones and make it about Betty, but you don't put in Fred and then you change Betty to be completely different. So why even call it Velma? Evan, what do you, I mean, exactly. Uh, that, that's the whole problem with it is this looks more like a show that should have been done brand new, you know, create your own characters, create a whole new scenario and, and, and put it out that way. They're just Why? trying to Why use. They're just trying to use the popularity of the Scooby Doo brand to yeah, exactly. build up this show. All right, well, and, and to build up and, and to build up, you know, the whole diversity and, and inclusive and inclusivity. But here's the thing: when you take classic characters and you change them that much, I mean, Velma is—I believe she's Native American on the show. 
uh, they make Daphne Asian, and she's got les two lesbian moms. And um, I'm trying to made, modernize uh, it. Yeah, Shaggy isn't Shaggy anymore. He's known as Norval. That's like his full name, and and he's African American. I mean, they they you're not just changing a few aspects. You're you're changing everything. Just create your own show. You've obviously got an idea of what you want to do. Create your own show. Create your own characters, and leave the classics alone. Well, it comes off as so just disingenuous because you're you're taking this property, you're keeping almost nothing. And I have you seen the the pictures they released of Scooby in this show? No. Yeah, Norval is going to have it looks like a girlfriend who's also African American, and her name is Scooby, but it's spelled with an I. Oh God. <laughs> Wow, has this so, I mean, has this premiered already or no? Yeah, yeah it's on it's on HBO Max. All right, yeah, I, it just sounds to me like HBO is just uh, just grabbing the brand franchise and building off a whole new story and characters with just the same and names. So you, you could modernize Scooby Doo. There's a lot of cool things that you could really bring in to the group. You know, because of social media cell phones and all this, and honestly, Listen, they were always skeptics in the show. You can really didn't they do that with, they with Mystery Inc. Yeah, you could do such a great angle. Like you could have done basically the kids' versions of like Ghost Hunters with Scooby Doo. They go and investigate, and then when it turns out that it's actually just somebody in the costume, they catch them and turn them, you know, turn them over to the cops and. You know, there's the new angle. They're trying to prove the paranormal exists. Yeah. Then you can have one character who doesn't believe, one character who does. There's a lot of ways you could have modernized Scooby-Doo that would have been kid-friendly and that wouldn't have changed everything. Now, what about this show makes it not kid-friendly? I mean, what it language? What is it? Language, nudity. Really? Yes. Wow. Now, just from... I haven't seen an episode. I've just seen the trailer... For, they did at uh, one of the Warner Brother um, panels or something. I think it was Comic Con, and it showed a fully nude. Uh, I think it was Daphne, and it even showed pubic hair, <laughs> which is completely inappropriate. Oh, like it's, it, it wants to be an edgy adult <laughs> swim show, but it wants to do it with kid friendly characters, and it's just if you change if you change the everyone's name and change the style so it's nothing like scooby-doo i bet it would have been reviewed much much better than it is now now the way the way it got my attention my kid who's been watching scooby-doo all his life turned it on and turned it off 15 minutes later he says that's not scooby-doo yeah i remember you you <laughs> you wrote us about that saying that you never thought that would happen in like a million years and he asked <laughs> to turn it off uh uh, what's HBO doing with this? Are they are they doing a second season? I assume not. Uh, I think I don't know anything for sure. I because I watch as many videos to kind of get as much information as I can when it comes to this stuff, and it looks like they're tr they're going to try to do a second season. I don't see it happening. I think by the end of this season they're going to quietly cancel it or just never talk about it again, which would be. For <laughs> Are you, are you, Bob, does this make you want to check, check this at least one episode out and see what it's about? Not really, because I mean, neither. Me neither. one time is precious and two is just stuff like this. Think, I'm just, I'm burned out on it because I think they I'm want, more horrified by the idea. <laughs> well, they want to do inclusivity and that's great, but there is so many great actual characters that you can do things like that with. And I don't yeah. think taking Scooby-Doo and bastardizing it was the yeah. route to go, and then not even put the real Scooby-Doo in it. Exactly. I mean, there's a kid's show called Craig of the Creek that does it so tastefully. You know, they don't they don't throw it in your face. It doesn't become the basis of the whole show the way the, you know, yeah, they just don't do it with classic characters. Yeah. Anyway, moving on, uh, another franchise that might be coming to an end let me bring that up, is one of the best horror franchises, I'll go ahead and say it, and that's the Conjuring franchise. Uh, they are doing a fourth film, but according to James Wan, the fourth film 
may be the final film in the Conjuring <laughs> franchise. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be the final film in the Conjuring universe. Uh, Did he say that Anna- about the third one? <laughs> Annabelle, The Nun, this has spawned a lot of spin-offs that have done well in their own right. Now, The Conjuring 3, The Devil Made Me Do It, uh, was okay. It was good. I actually rewatched it like two weeks ago. Uh, but it's nowhere near as good as the first and the second one. Uh, I didn't like the fact that they brought in the whole living person witch aspect into the third film that was causing the demonic possessions and all the curses and all that. Uh, I think that that just, you know, sort of took away from the 100% paranormal aspect of the film. Uh, as far as the Warrens and their story, Efren, do you agree that it's time to put the main film I, stories I, I to rest? I don't think there should even be a fourth one. I think you got to let the Warrens sleep, man. <laughs> there, enough already. There is a scene. I love characters. So yeah. I, 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 I'm geared up for the fourth one because I, I did enjoy the third one because it it wasn't trying to be any more complicated than it really yeah. was. And I, I get the embellishment thing, but honestly, I'd be okay if the fourth is the last one if they greenlit like a show yeah. with Patrick Wilson and Vera Farminga the next day because really the appeal yeah. of those movies is just the chemistry between those two actors yeah. and well, seeing them there, in those There roles. is, but their, their chemistry is nothing like the real words. <laughs> no, 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 they're not. And the stories are really loosely based on what... Especially, uh, all all three movies are uh, Arnie Johnson, the third one, uh, the uh, the uh, Rhode, Rhode Island House, and the first Conjuring movie. Uh, they're all very very loosely based on the Warrens' involvement in those cases. But I I just I enjoyed the third one. Uh, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it a lot. But compared to the other two. The first two were much, much better. Uh, now, they are also making a non-sequel. Now, that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I am too. The way that they ended the first one and how they actually tied it into the Conjuring movie. And, I mean, do you have high expectations, Efren, for the sequel for the nun? I do. I mean, I, I, I am fascinated by the Valak demon and, the, and yeah. the way it kind of tied it into Annabelle creation and uh, I just I'm curious to see what they're going to do with the second nun. Bob what do you think is going to there's no real mention about the Annabelle series what do you think they're going to do with that I I just think they're taking a little bit of time off from it just because one of the bigger forces I think was um, the I think it's the director of the second one that ended up doing uh, a Marvel movie or something I, I can't remember because I haven't seen the Annabelle movies. Well, James Wan uh, did the new Aquaman movie that's yet to come out. Um, I I think um, I think Annabelle's just taking like some time off. I think they're going to bring her back. I think it's probably going to be after Conjuring 4 because after that comes out, there is going to be that question, is, is this universe dead? Is like the nun the big cap off or is this the big cap off? And my... My two predictions are uh, they'll get a good director for four and it'll just be a surprise hit. So they'll talk about it and decide to make a five, but they'll they'll put it off for a few years so that it feels like you've had no conjuring for a bit. And I do think Annabelle will probably get another movie. Me too. This franchise has been way too successful. I think you're right. They're just going to wait. This hasn't even, I think this is still in script development. They're going to film it release it see how well it does uh and then any decision moving forward is going to really solely depend on how much money the conjuring four makes and how much of a cry there is from the people to keep this franchise moving on and you got to keep in mind beyond the nun and beyond annabelle there are so many more stories just that we've seen in the movies from their little haunted room museum upon which more spin-offs can be done. You know, I mean, Efren, are you a fan of them continuing to expand the universe 
or do you want them to well, keep it contained to where it is right now? I was looking the other day, and I, is there true that there's uh, with the is there are there really five Insidious movies already? Yeah. <laughs> See, I lost count. I don't think I've Isn't seen that, the fifth one. And uh, that's another great franchise with Patrick Wilson. Uh, you know, he was great in it. He's he's not. Yeah. You he start was, losing track after a while. So yeah, he was in, in, the, in a way. I like what they've done with with this series because they branch out on it. You know, it's not just one continuous series. Yeah, because it, it does get boring after a while. Well, Ed d- did have an apprentice um, that his his daughter ended up marrying. So I mean, there's yeah. always room, even if you don't want to continue like with Ed and Lorraine, which I get because there's a lot of hubbub about that whole thing but you know you could always do the apprentice you could do your tv show like they did with highlander where you have the main duo in the opening episode to kind of introduce everybody then they leave and then you follow you know their daughter and her husband as they're doing their paranormal stuff and then you have a lot more to embellish and then you have all the artifacts there's Really, there's countless avenues you can really take with this. And absolutely. And the Warrens themselves are a brand. They are a high-value brand. And you mentioned their son-in-law. There's a new show that came out last month on Netflix called uh, Haunted 28 or 28 Haunted. Now, what they do is they take three... It's a. It's a... It's an area that Netflix has never really delved into, and that is paranormal investigating. What 28 Haunted is, is they take three separate paranormal investigative groups and put them into three different locations throughout the country. And they have to spend the full 28 days there. And one of the people that are monitoring all three groups is the Warren's son-in-law. Wow. So that's just them building on that that the whole Warren's brand, and the the basis of this show is that the Warrens. I don't know if this is true or not, but the Warrens supposedly had a theory that in order to fully get the scope and magnitude of a potential haunting going on in someone's home or at a location, you can't just go in there for a day or two. You got to spend at least 28 days to sort of get the full picture of what's going on. So the show was very, very interesting. Uh, What I found interesting is that about two, two and a half weeks in, all three groups started to sort of rub each other the wrong way. Like there's at least two or three people in each group. And, you know, spending four weeks with somebody that you don't really know that well. There's going to be disagreements. There's, I mean, some of it, a lot of it is played up for the television part. But you guys should should check it out because it takes the Warrens brand and incorporates it into a new Netflix show in a genre that Netflix has never gone into before, and that is the whole paranormal investigation. So, anyway... I'd love to see somebody do a movie where they actually portray them realistically. Well, that's going to be boring. It'd be so mean, too. It would be so mean-spirited. I mean, I don't think anybody watches The Conjuring. I don't doubt doubt that they, you know, that she was the real deal. Well, he was a lot of bluff and talk, you know. (laughs) He was... Go on. Sorry. Also, you're you're getting you would you would have to end up getting into the rumors that, like, I think the craziest thing I read was they shared a lover and that kind of stuff. No, oh, that and, I don't want to see. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like, I feel like there's no way to do it and just not be mean spirited. <laughs> and I think the appeal is, it's really not so much the characters Ed and Lorraine. It's really in the performances between Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga. Like, if you exactly. give those two, if you give them two different character names. If you call them John and Janet Smith, it'll be just as good. the exact situation. Yeah. People are going to love it just because people love seeing that chemistry with them. They like, have a great fun to watch. Them. I totally agree with you. They have a great chemistry. You actually mm-hmm. can feel the love that they have for another, for one another. And if people were told the truth, 
Well, hell, you want the truth in regards to the first Conjuring movie with the Perrin family? They showed up. They did the seance. It went horribly wrong. And the dad, Roger Perrin, kicked the Warrens out. And if you hear the story from the kids, and I mean, not only did Roger, the dad, kick him out, he physically threw them out of the house. Because the risk and the danger that they put his wife through. Because what happened during that seance is she got picked up from the seance chair and thrown like 10 feet back into the kitchen. And that was, you know, he saw that as them just exploiting their situation, not really trying to help them. And then the insult thing, I think they were only there for like half a day and then they left. So, I mean, the, the fun of the series is the chemistry and the embellishment because yeah. we're at a time where we just want heroes. Like we don't, if, if you made a movie about the real Warrens, like how they really were or the way a lot of people believe they were, you wouldn't have really the kind of fun with it. You What you would have is something pretty depressing, pretty bland, unless you got like somebody really talented to make it look pretty. But then again, like you're taking away from the real grayness of it. Absolutely. I totally, I totally agree. I don't want to see the real stories because I've heard the real stories and they're boring. I have absolutely no problem with 98% of the films being completely made up. So, uh, some announcements to make here. Um, this coming Thursday, speaking of the paranormal, we are going to be welcoming the Kindred Spirits team Amy Bruni, Adam Barry, and Chip Coffey. Discovery Plus is getting ready to release a brand new season of Kindred Spirits on January 20th. So I'm looking very much forward to talking to those three. Uh, Another note here, this weekend is going to be the second and final weekend of our Sin Expose uh, Virtual Horror Film Festival. Uh, We... Last year, 2021, was our first annual. This is our second annual film festival. We got like twice as many submissions, some great films. And we actually have a clip from last week's. That's not it. Okay, so check this out. This is just a clip from last week's, uh, one of the movies from last week. So, uh, that's just a little taste. Uh, We are celebrating filmmakers from around the world. We literally have submissions from South America, Europe, and all over the world. And we have a full slate starting this Friday through Sunday. Another three days jam-packed starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. You can watch live at the Sin Expose YouTube channel c-i-n-e-x-p-o-s-e just go to youtube search for that and you'll see the uh the the upcoming shows listed on top they're not yet listed for this upcoming week weekend but they will be in the next couple of days so definitely go ahead and check that out and And what sets what sets an expose for apart from other film festivals is you know the, the audience gets to pick our winners so sunday night we'll be picking We'll be voting for all the, all the uh, festival winners. And we do have uh, day two and three from last weekend still up on YouTube. So while you're waiting for this weekend to come, you can catch up on the days that you missed from last week. 
Uh, and some other great news this past week, uh, as you know, Dead Talk Live is produced by uh, our company, Dead Talk Media, which is a production and distribution film distribution company. We signed a new movie to distribute by Thomas G. Waite, who a lot of you know as Windows from The Thing. He was in The Warriors, uh, starred opposite Al Pacino and in Justice for All. He has a new uh, sexual comedy, and this thing is, uh, it's edgy. It's called Target. Check out our social media. I posted the trailer today, uh, and I'm going to play it for you guys right now if you haven't seen it yet. This film is being released this coming spring. We don't have an exact date yet, but as soon as we get one, we'll definitely let you know. But check out the trailer to Target. Why? Don't you want to be intimate with just me? It's just with me, the intimacy comes after you have sex with another man. Why are you like this? I'm a pervert. <laughs> I need to take our sex life to a higher gear. Okay, I'll think about it. But I have to pick the guy. Dick's Deli. Oh, you mean that guy that works there? Can you give me a ride on that bike sometime? The first time saw him you're blocking the walkway with your bike friend nowhere else to park one thing i know is you two love each other and are devoted to one another and that i respect salute jump in the lake anyone i may seem normal no you don't seem normal at all nice buys dude i am cuckoldom it's a metaphor for guys whose wives cheat on them but some men actually want their wives to have lovers. Ow. Let's put it this way. I'm a process guy. Okay. Ugh. Honey, I know that you want this, but his soul stays in me forever, they say. I'm really flexible. Wanna wrestle for her? What? I hate people! You're not gonna like it! <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. But it appears your house has been targeted. Ah! Here, do you need some water? Why? Why do I want a glass of water? You stabbed him, then you shot him? Wow. He was already stabbed. I shot him by accident. <laughs> Why would you shoot him if he was already stabbed? Can I get a glass of water? <laughs> so what About what? Vinny. Come in. In case things get too crazy with Jeff. Don't work out, we have a backup plan. A backup plan? Goodbye. <laughs> I was just going. There you guys have it. Target coming this spring. It's uh, it's edgy, it's a boatload of fun and lots of laugh, but it is edgy, gotta warn you right there. It'll be available on streaming video on demand, Sometime this spring, please keep an eye out on our social media and news channels. Uh, the trailer is up now on our Dead Talk Live uh, YouTube channel. So anyway, I guess that brings us to the end of our show. Believe it or not, we've been going for almost 50 minutes. I want to thank you guys. I think this was great. I really enjoyed talking about uh, the latest entertainment news stories. There's always something new talk about and uh you know i've said this before I, you know i'm so busy i don't really get to keep up or read a lot of the entertainment news being in the industry as we are so uh, i rely on our chats on our team chats <laughs> to, to stay informed because a lot of the times i have just no idea what's going on so i want to thank both you guys uh, again, this is Efren Rodriguez, our executive producer, and Bob Garland, one of our lead writers. Uh, until this Thursday, join us at 1 p.m. Eastern for, uh, to tune in and watch the Kindred Spirits team. Their new season is starting January 20th. On behalf of Bob, Efren, and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Good night, everybody. Good night.